British concert pianist Leslie Howard is the only pianist ever to have recorded the entire solo piano works by Hungarian composer Franz Liszt. He's won many awards and accolades for his playing and I'm so pleased that he's joining me here today at his home in London for a classical conversation. Welcome. Hello, Melanie. Lovely to chat to you. And to you. It's a very hot day. It's too hot. <laughs> I'm getting hotter apparently. I don't know. When it gets north of 18 degrees, I don't want to know. <laughs> Well, I want, to, I want to start by asking you all about your education, how old you were when you started, whether you come from a musical family, what was the catalyst? Um, I suppose really the catalyst were, well there were two, um, there was a piano in the house on which my mum had had a few lessons when she was a teenager but um, that's to say it didn't take. Um, <laughs> and my dad who was a very enthusiastic listener and had done a bit of music hall singing in his youth but um, but no musicians in the family. Mm. But then I'm the first of four siblings and we were all musicians of one sort or another. Mm -hmm. So, so don't quite know how that happened, but... Um, Did you start very young? I started to play when I was two. I could <laughs> play anything that my parents could sing or pick out of an instrument, I could copy immediately. And uh, anything I heard on the radio, I could uh, copy. And so... Right. It, it was... The only thing that was difficult was learning eventually to read music properly, because... Because you've done it all by ear. Well, it slowed me down mm. quite a bit. Mm. When I was, I remember I was four, and I thought, you know, this was surely not <laughs> the way to go <laughs> forward, but uh, it turned out to be all right. It was only a brief space before the one thing caught up with the other. So which teachers then do you think were most crucial in your development? My very first one, it's a lady called June McLean, who's in her late 80s now, um, and who had uh, returned to Australia where I was born. And um, she'd been studying in France with Corto. Mm. And uh, I'm very lucky because I had a very, very good technical grounding from the beginning, so I didn't have bad habits that had to be fixed later. Right. And, uh, that was my next question. How did you develop your, your technique? What did you do? Well, I was impatient to run before I could walk because uh, my hands were too small to play all the music that I wanted to play. But uh, I remember the first time I tried to play the Liszt Sixth Rhapsody and I really could only just take octaves all right. And, wow. uh, <laughs> and since there's five pages of them at the end, <laughs> without relief. <Yes. laughs> I thought that was, then I thought that was an impossible piece. Now it's just very difficult, like everything else, but, <laughs> but that's how it started. And um, I had really to wait to be physically mature mm. to do everything I wanted to do. But um, my next really good teacher was a man called Donald Britton, who was uh, head of music at my secondary school. And um, I had already um, got a performing diploma when I was 13 or something. Mm. And, um, and I suppose I thought I could play. And uh, I rolled into my first lesson with him. And you know, I'd passed the audition, won a scholarship and all of this sort of stuff. But then he just put a hide and string quartet up on the music desk and said, play that. <laughs> and. Uh, and I was really thrown. <laughs> Nobody had ever made me read a sea cliff before, mm. let alone off four staves at once. And uh, I was determined not to be beaten by him again, so I actually went off and did the work and <laughs> learned how to do it. And uh, so I turned up for the next lesson with him a week later. And uh, he put up the full score of Vaughan Williams' uh, setting of the 100th Psalm. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I said, Come on, it's a bit, bit difficult, isn't it, sir? And uh, I said, no, 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 just the choral parts. <laughs> so uh, there I am, I'm reading the choral parts, hope, <coughs> hoping not to forget that the tenor had to be played an octave lower than it was written. And um, got to the end of that with uh, uh, making too many mistakes. And uh, he said, very good, now play it again in D minor. Oh. <laughs> So it didn't matter what I did, he made me do something more yes. and convinced me at, a, at, a, at the right age, I think, 
that playing the piano was all very well, but being a musician was much more important. Mm. And uh, so, and of course, I learned harmony and counterpoint and composition, and played the organ and the harpsichord and the, the oboe and mm. all, of, all of all of the things that a good music master makes you do sure. when you're at school, and um, <clears throat> which helped later because you know, I played the oboe in pit orchestras and I did time as an organist and choir Useful master training, and um, you know you do, you, do, you do all of the stuff that makes your general musicianship stay alive. I have to confess that I haven't practiced the organ properly for decades but uh, I still <laughs> love to play it occasionally. The, the, the most likely thing I'm ever asked to do is to play for friends weddings. <laughs> That's quite fun though isn't it? It is <laughs> and, then, and then I do you know 30 minutes practice. <laughs> it's very naughty. I'm not recommending this as, 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 a, as a thing to do. But all pianists should actually have a go at playing mm, the organ. Definitely. Um, if for nothing else, just to learn what it is like to play Bach on an instrument mm. you might have recognised. Mm, mm, um, quite. Because uh, one of these nine foot Steinway thingies, uh, I don't think would have pleased him greatly at all. And <laughs> Never quite understood why we all do it, but um, we're quite fond of playing transcriptions of things that were not written for a harpsichord or a clavichord, <laughs> such as you know the, some of those big organ works transcribed for piano. Yes. That, that, that's quite a nice thing to do, but I'm not quite sure about doing things like playing the well-tempered clavier um, on the piano in concerts. I know everyone studies it, and everyone should study it, mm. but. Um, somehow the temptation to put in pianistic things like crescendos and diminuendos or accents <laughs> or the, the very worst habit of all playing the subject of the fugue louder than the surrounding texture. <laughs> that's, just a, that's just a bad habit which um, the piano encourages in a way that the harpsichord absolutely forbids. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so everyone should also learn to play the harpsichord and learn to read figured bass and all yeah. of that. How did you establish your career? Did you take part in competitions? Did you broadcast radio? Because I know you... you I started you, broadcasting when I great. was 13. Um, and played quite a lot on television in Australia when I was a kid. Um, won a competition there which paid for me to go abroad and to stay and to study and... Uh, I didn't leave there until I already um, had a couple of degrees and was I wriggled out of being uh, turned into a full-time musicologist, which is what my university wanted me to do. And they said, oh, you can always play, you always play, but uh, you know, <laughs> we, we need somebody like you <coughs> on the staff teaching people all about musicology. And I said, well, actually, no, I really want to go abroad and do the playing that I know that I was put on the earth to do, mm -hmm. and do as much musicology as I can around the edges. Um, and I have managed to do that. I uh, never really went into many competitions, went in a few, got a few prizes, um, was usually regarded as too unorthodox, mostly because of my repertoire choices. Right. Uh, because, you know, I, if they said play a piece of um, Baroque music, then I, I mean, my favourite was to play the Kunau Biblical Sonata about David and Goliath. Um, I wasn't just going to play on a Bach Prelude and Fugue or a Scarlatti <laughs> Sonata, um, but that's the you know the the enthusiasms of youth because having in more recent years sat on juries, you, some jurors like to hear music they don't know and others absolutely cannot bear it mm, yeah. because they think it makes it impossible for them to make a judgment, which I think is really rather terrible. But. Um, mm. All of the competitions on which I've ever sat on the board, I have done my level best either to fix it so that the repertoire is free, or else fix it so that it forces people to learn interesting and less familiar pieces. Mm, right. Because for the piano we've got the largest repertoire of any instrument by some colossal distance. And it really is extraordinary how good it is. And yet there's a sort of core repertoire which keeps cropping up again and again as if nobody's ever looked any further. And even within famous composers, I mean, there are Beethoven sonatas that are a rarity, mm. unless somebody's playing all of them. 
Yeah. Um, but I, it's a long time since I heard a recital in which somebody says showcased up at seven. Um, yeah. You know, they weren't proud. And the number of young people now who almost the first Beethoven sonata they learn is the last one he wrote. Yeah. And um, I really think that, that ought to be hotly discouraged. <laughs> Remember my, my other marvellous teacher uh, in Italy, Guido Agosti, um, who uh, in his classes in Siena, this 15-year-old um, American girl who was quite gifted, uh, came in and played Opus 109. And um, he really couldn't deal with it at all, and he just closed the book and handed it back to her and said, I'm sorry, I can't do anything with this. And, um, and she looked terribly shocked. And he said, tell me now, do you know how many sonatas Beethoven wrote before this one? And uh, she had a rough stab, but it wasn't bad. And, <laughs> and he said, how many of those have you studied? Oh, uh, one. Oh, well, when you've learned the other 29, please bring this one back. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, <laughs> I don't know, he, he was, but he was quite right. Yes, yes. And uh, I've... I don't have my own students really, I just teach master classes because I travel too much as a player, but uh, mm. whenever I have any chance to influence what people put in their repertoire, of course they've got to play Beethoven sonatas and so on, but uh, you know, start at the first one. Um, learn, you know, play the, if you want something that looks good on a program, play the three sonatas from Opus 10. Mm. You've got to be a proper musician to do that. And, um, or, or the three of Opus 31, or the two of Opus 27 which go together fantastically well. Mm. And, um, but try and create a repertoire that makes you look a little bit different from everybody else. Because all of these people who do competition where you have to play a Prelude and Fugue and Four Studies and a Beethoven Sonata and blah blah blah, um, they all play the same stuff. And there isn't the work out there for them, so you know, they, they get mm. concerts as a result of winning a competition. But those concerts are predicated on the winner of the competition, not on the person. So when the competition comes around again, somebody else gets those concerts. Mm. And establishing yourself in the business is a lot harder. And um, I was very lucky, firstly, to be asked to make recordings when I was only in my mid-twenties. And that was also back in the day when you know you, part, you did the BBC audition, which you eventually passed, and then mm. I used to get a dozen broadcasts a year, um, and you'd go into a BBC studio, there aren't these things anymore, um, specifically designed for performing, like the Concert Hall Broadcasting House, which no longer is a concert hall, mm. or the, the marvellous studios at Pebble Mill, uh, but I record oh, all the BBC studios up and down the country, sure. I've, I've recorded sure. Um, but uh, but I was being asked to do this because I actually had pursued an interesting repertoire. Mm. If all I had to offer was the Appassionata, I would never have gotten. No, no. Um, and it wasn't just because I was playing Liszt, but it was because I was playing a lot of Haydn and a lot of lesser-known Beethoven and uh, yeah. other lesser-known composers. But but things that well things which people play now, but they didn't play then, like the the Rachmaninoff sonatas. In the 1970s, they were they were fairly rare, especially the first one. Um, the Glazunov sonatas, which I recorded in 1975, love to do them again now, but um, <laughs> I couldn't possibly listen to that. Uh, I don't listen to any of my records anyway. But I'm, I'm not alone in that. Most most performers don't. No, but, no. Um, well, tell us a little bit about the Liszt project because it's quite an achievement to have recorded all the solo works well, by Liszt. That started really because. I was completely hooked on him from the first time I heard some of his orchestral music. It had nothing to do with the piano at mm. all. I heard a live performance of the Faust Symphony when I was about 13. And I just thought this is the most amazing piece. And, um, yeah. and so I, I, I started looking for his music and then found out how much there was that wasn't piano music. And, um, you know, took a close interest in all of it. I played his organ works and uh, got involved in conducting some of the choral pieces and uh, 
got busy with him and the, the more I looked, the more interesting a composer he became. Mm. And um, I kept on reading the odd rude remark about him written by all sorts of musical pundits. And it usually transpired that what they really didn't like was the way young piano players played Liszt's music rather than Liszt's music itself, though mm. they blamed Liszt for writing the music that made them play that way. Um, but I don't think list music actually asks you to play in a vulgar or nasty <laughs> fashion. Um, and I, you know, it sometimes comes as a surprise when you tell people, you know, there's list rate right over three thousand pieces of one sort or another for all sorts and conditions of instruments mm. or voices, um, of which fourteen hundred are for piano. Out of these fourteen hundred, there's about fifty that are in standard regular circulation. That's true. And, um, and a lot of the performances don't actually show any depth of understanding of, of the composer at all. And I, I think people need to look a bit wider. It distresses me <clears throat> that people want to play the sonata either as the first piece of list they learn or as the second piece of list they learn. Mm. And you think, you know, you would play this piece a lot better if you studied the Gosses Concert Solo or the Scherzo and March or the Weiner Klagen Variations or, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of the Sarabande and Chacon, the Benediction de Dieu, and they're just surprised to find out that uh, Liszt wrote more quiet pieces than loud ones, more slow pieces than fast ones, and um, many, many more of his pieces in softly than quietly, than, mm -hmm. than loudly. Yes. And, um, but, there's no excuse now. I'm, I'm happy to have played some part in this. Um, and it goes into 99 CDs, is that right? It does. Recordings? Well, I beat the list edition, uh, which is in Budapest, <coughs> to recording this music before they published it all. Oh, um, okay. Well, they started printing these volumes in 1968. But it's been quite slow. It's, it's, it's a good edition, but um, I just always wanted some of the, you know, the, instead of starting with the things that everybody had in their collections, mm. they really should have started right in with the things that you, could, you couldn't find anywhere. And that would have been better and then they would have had more subscribers and it would have sold faster and it would have been better financed. But um, to start with, they wanted to uh, print only the final versions of Liszt's music. Anyone who's had a good look at Liszt will know that he was an inveterate reviser of his works. Mm. Um, Sometimes it's because he wanted to thin it out technically, sometimes that was because of the, the much increased heaviness of the piano touch by the time he got to his middle life, as distinct from the, the, the instruments that he played when he was actually on stage. Most people don't remember that his great career as a solo player only lasted for about nine years mm -hmm. and um, that he gave up um, in 1847, so that's before the first Steinway was built by some distance. Um, the biggest pianos that he would have played by then would have been the best seven foot Erards. And, um, and he would have played um, a Broadwood that went for six and a half octaves. But um, by the end of his life, of course, he'd been playing pianos or teaching on pianos at any rate, which we would find pretty similar to the instruments we have now, including the, even a piano with a sostenuto pedal, which mm. he had from Steinways in 1883. Um, it's trying to recreate the sort of playing that he must have been able to do is quite hard because it's clear that all of the things with the superhuman difficulties that he wrote when he was in his early 20s really didn't cost him any physical effort at all. They cost him a great emotional effort. And there's a famous account of him fainting. And actually, you know, they published an obituary of him in Paris um, <laughs> when he was only 17. Um, he fainted again when he was 20, when he was playing his concert stick for two pianos on themes and Mendelssohn songs without words. It's a piece which then disappeared from view and it wasn't published until the 1980s, and uh, which I happened to edit. But uh, mm. 
I recorded that for the BBC with Ian Munro, 19, 1987 or something. Um, and uh, although it's a taxing piece, uh, there was no sign of anyone fainting. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, but listen, <laughs> when he last played it, he had to be carried off on a stretcher. So, <laughs> so he must have got very involved with what he was yes. doing. <laughs> um, for, for the rest of it, um, it was it was the the thrill of looking for things that you knew existed but no, that no one had found. Um, on the recordings there are 300 pieces that at the time were not published, quite a few of them have been published since. Mm -hmm. The new list edition very kindly has um, decided that if it's in my recording uh, list um, they better see what they can do about printing it. So they, <laughs> they changed their mind about not printing only one version. Right. Because people kept asking them, people kept sending them letters, you know, excuse me, Howard's recorded this piece. Which volume can I find it yes. in? Yes. <laughs> uh, so um, um, I've given given their project a bit of a <laughs> kick in the backside. So sure. they're producing thirteen supplementary volumes. Right. That's how much extra music wow. there is from what they were originally t intending to to publish. Goodness. Just just for the piano solos. Um, I don't think I'll ever live long enough to see the rest of their edition. I mean, at this rate, I think it'll be going for about another 250 years before they get everything out. <laughs> um, that does happen with collected editions, because mm. people get bogged down in mm. various bits of scholarship. Mm. But um, And it's also very expensive. Mm. But you, you're writing two books on list currently. Trying um, to. Can you tell us a little bit about I'm them? Trying to do more than, more than I can manage, really, because in between, I... You know, I, I, I've produced quite a lot of editions, mm, and right. you know, critical editions with you know proper scholarly apparatus and so on, um, of Liszt and also of Paganini and also Bellini and just things that I've burned up about. Mm, mm, but uh, mm. but they take a long time to do. And I started with a, a friend of mine in 1991, a man called Michael Short, who's in the Liszt Society, um, and he does all of the documentary research and I do all of the musical research and analysis of manuscripts and what have you but we're producing a thematic catalogue of the complete works and we're about well the paperwork bit of it getting the information I think we must be better than better than 90 percent done right putting the themes into the computer which is an endless task and a thankless one. I'm about halfway there. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's been going for over 20 years. But, uh, but of course, at the beginning, um, the, the beginning was before they invented decent music writing programs on the computer. Mm -hmm. um, there were a couple, but they were, they were impossible. Um, but um, I know some people swear by Finale, and I, I swear by Sibelius. I mm. presume for no better reason than I finally learned how to do it. Um, so, uh, you know, when I did the Paganini Fifth Concerto, they, I actually did the setting that's reproduced in the edition. Right. Um, which saves a lot of trouble. Mm. Yes. Out the middle, as long as you don't make any mistakes. <laughs> um, and you do have to show it to other people. I was going to say, it must be edited um, or it must be looked at. <laughs> well, you. It's like you need another pair of ears to listen to you play occasionally and tell you a straight from the shoulder report. <laughs> um, one of my dearest friends um, is my old teacher that I came to London to study with Noretta Conchi. And she, she was not a, mu a musicologist type of teacher. She was much more instinctive, but absolutely on the ball. And, uh, You'd play something, and she'd say, "It's very nice, my Leslie, but but it's a little bit boring," <laughs> because I was, you know, I was so I was very keen when I was in my twenties just to get this music out there and play it, and people, you know, but but uh, I'd forgotten a few things while I was doing it, <laughs> like how to get it to pass over the footlights <laughs> and uh, into the souls of the listeners. And uh, she was marvellous at curing me of that. <laughs> I used to be very straight-laced. <laughs> uh, 
because it, you know it really is important. You've only got 25 minutes. You, the, the, the Sibelius Sonata and the people, and yes. if you want to sell it to them, that's that's it's got to be done then. Yes, yes. Uh, you can't do it on a promise or having written a nice program note about it. It's actually got to grab them when you play it. So sure. that's what I try to do, sure. and um, I hope to succeed more times than not. But uh, you, you never can tell, and you and you do need other ears, mm. and you do need other eyes when you edit from a manuscript. My eye looking at this manuscript is, is I think, pretty good. Um, mm. You know, because you, if you show a manuscript to somebody who's never looked at one before, and then the, they take one and they say, well, how can you make head or tail of that? So if you've never seen a manuscript of Beethoven's and you have a look at his handwriting of the Opus 111 Sonata, mm. you can only marvel at the genius of the engraver who <laughs> made the first edition <laughs> that he got through that nightmare. Um, and and yet, when you get used to looking at Beethoven's handwriting, mm. it's not so bad. Mm. It doesn't mean that there are, aren't problems that are not easily solved. I occasionally spend uh, a morning with uh, Jonathan Del Mar. He's, he's, yeah. he's doing a tremendous job editing Beethoven, but a man of proper conviction but decent humility who, when he's got the job done, instead of just rushing into print with it, he goes to people mm. who've lived with the, with the music, often for longer than he has, but they, we haven't done the same work that he has. And just to say, you know, and to say, you know is, there, is there any way that this slur can possibly be here because it seems wrong or, and it's not in anyone else's edition, but it is in the manuscript, so is it a mistake or do we put it in? Um, you know, he, he questions himself and and either you rattle back and reinforce his opinion or you suggest, well, actually, it might be right, but it might be right for another reason. Um, it just gave me some extraordinary fingering, which crops up on, a, on an odd page of the piano part of Beethoven's of a 70 number one trio. And it's not in the printed edition, but it is handwritten in a copy of it by Beethoven. And it's meticulous fingering of the most unorthodox nature, <laughs> and, um, but if you use it, it works. And you just think, you know, that's not the fingering journey would have written for it, but, but let me try this, and you try it, and you think, well, it's, it'll do, it does, it, because it forces you to put the right finger mm. in the right place to, to make all of the appropriate articulations and accents and so on. And, um, you know, sometimes you can't do all of, of composers' fingerings like that, but. Um, but it's, it's very much worth having the, these things and, and, and to have a look why a composer sometimes writes something odd. Mm. Um, and you, you've got to be very careful about dismissing it as a slip of the pen. Mm. Um, I, I mean, sometimes it must be. But if, you, if you're doing a proper edition, you've got to, you've got to show, show them what was there. Mm. And if there are differences between the manuscript and the edition, and we don't have any of the information about what took place in between, like a corrected proof copy or a letter, which we sometimes have, where somebody says, well, I, you know, please add that bar to the beginning of the slogan, which we have with Beethoven for the Opus 106. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, that, that's tremendous when you can do that. In the case of the last cello sonata, we have a copyist's manuscript, which is more important than the original manuscript in several particulars, because in that, Beethoven added four more bars at the right. beginning of the last moment. Um, and we wouldn't be without them, would we? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> so I occasionally have to um, give little talks to uh, young music students about um, it's not just a question of going down the street and dying it. Um, if you really want to know how this piece was put together, actually see if you can find out how it was put together. See if there is a, is a manuscript that you can look at because it will force you to think about the real way this music came into being. Mm. And um, that might actually help you when you're playing. It's not because you're just there to discover that there might be a wrong note in bar 33 that nobody's found before, um, though that sometimes happens. But it's just to immerse yourself in 
something of the creative process behind the piece. And um, I always tell people to do that, to have a look and see what else the composer was writing around the same time, and then see what other composers were writing at the same time that your composer might have known. Mm -hmm. um, apart from anything else, it's fun. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's as entertaining as following any soap on television uh, <laughs> to, to, to know. Well, sometimes people look, look at their, their subject very narrowly. And, um, and of course, there's so much information in the world about so many things. It's harder and harder to be a Renaissance man, mm. but um, but you know, music isn't created independently of social history or of political history sometimes, and it's worth it to know what it was like to find out, you know, what was the temperature like in the concert hall, um, you know, what did it smell like? <laughs> um, Can you really recreate it? Uh, well, you know. But, it, you you can't you can't actually do this, but you can't do everything. But it's worth knowing as much as you can about the circumstances, mm. and knowing knowing as people quite often forget that a sonata that was premiered, say by Mozart, would very often have its movements played separated one from the other by other other events going on in the evening, same with his string quartets and symphonies and mm, concertos. Yeah. And if people liked it, they might clap in the middle of a movement and they might get the movement to be repeated. Um, you know, it's a completely different way of doing things from how we play it now. It's going to say quite different from today. Well, we're so, we're so <laughs> reverent, as yes. we should be, in the face of some of these pieces. But, uh, you know, they would have been, we all know that even, even a work so magnificent as Beethoven's Violin Concerto, um, just in case the audience had fallen off in the middle, um, the uh, violinist at the first performance um, gave some uh, impromptu improvisations imitating the sounds of farm animals on his instrument, just to keep the public amused before he went <laughs> on to the slow movement. And, um, you know, that's barbaric. But, uh, but, <laughs> but they were frightened that people wouldn't stay paying attention to this concerto, which was, of course, for its time, far and away the longest violin concerto ever written. Mm. And mm. Um, <laughs> it's one of those pieces that's just perfect. Mm. And, you know, if it could go on for, for another 20 minutes, you'd be quite happy. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, you know. But, but, you know, Beethoven was taking risks. He took colossal risks with all sorts of things. He, he had this tremendous strength of knowing that he was right. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. it comes out in his letters all over the place, even when he was wrong, of course, because when he was wrong, he was magnificently wrong. And <laughs> he, he was magnanimous in his apologies afterwards if he offended somebody. But it would have been like walking a tightrope to be his friend. Because, uh, you know, if, if, if anyone said the wrong thing or did in his eyes the wrong thing, he would be mm. as firm and rude <laughs> as you could ever possibly imagine anyone being. <laughs> and then, then he would uh, calm down. What about what about future concerts and recordings? What have you got coming up? Um, the next recording is one I did in Italy, and um, it's with a friend of mine called Mattia Ometto, and we recorded all of the two piano music by uh, Reynaldo Arn. Now Reynaldo mm -hmm. Arn, people, I'm sure these days know some of the songs, yes. um, but there's a marvellous piano quintet and there's a piano concerto and there's all sorts of good stuff and um, very interesting composer mm -hmm. um, who could also sing and who in fact recorded accompanying himself um, and he came from Venezuela but he's essentially French um, but you know there's, <laughs> there's, there's, there's something extra in there and he was as admired by people as different as Poulenc and Stravinsky and um, you don't have to spend too much time before you think this man writes not only marvellously crafted and very agreeable music, but actually quite individual music as well. Mm. So um, that's the next one out. The last one out is the Rubenstein Piano Quartets, just came out from Hyperion. Mm. And um, they were first recordings. Anton Rubenstein is one of those composers that everybody knows about. Mm. And he's mentioned in every musical history, especially if you get 
to the end of the 19th, early 20th century, and you're talking about musical education, he's there. Yeah. And, um, you know, his, 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 his plan for the courses at St. Petersburg Conservatory, still used. Um, nothing wrong with it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but all of his music, of which there is a great tide, I have to say, but, uh, you know, it's, it's much harder to revive that. And yet I think it's worth it, mm. well worth it. We did get a concert performance of his opera, The Demon, a couple of years back. But some of the critics were a bit sniffy about it. But, you know, without The Demon, you would not have Evgeny Onegin. You just wouldn't. Um, it would have been completely different. Um, mm. So Rubenstein's creation of Tamara in The Demon uh, has some serious bearing on Tchaikovsky's treatment of Tatiana and Onegin. Um, Rubenstein's concertos, well, imitation being the sincerest form, as they say, you know. Yeah. Um, the, the cadenza at the beginning in, in, in the Tchaikovsky first concerto is, I mean, it's so clearly taken from the, the cadenza in Rubenstein's fourth that um, it's obviously a homage, it's not, it's not a steal, you know. And, uh, he crops up all over the place, I mean, you know, the Brahms said rude things about him but copied him and used bits, <laughs> bits, of, um, bits of his music in all sorts of places, including his second piano concerto. Um, Clara Schumann was rude about him and said uh, all of this music will be forgotten. Uh, <clears throat> she was quite sure that none of hers would be, but uh, <laughs> she might have been wrong there. Uh, <laughs> she was a very strange lady. Um, but anyway, Composers like Anton Rubinstein please me a great deal. Mm. And next year will be the 150th anniversary of Sibelius and Glazunov, and of Nielsen for that matter. Um, but I'm trying to get in there first. Um, <laughs> so I'm doing Sibelius and Glazunov sonatas at Wigmore in September. Right. And I'm doing them in a few festivals on the continent before that. Mm -hmm. And um, I love that stuff. Mm. It's marvellously written. Almost nobody knows that Sibelius wrote piano music, but there's over 200 piano pieces by Sibelius. Yeah. <laughs> um, and people don't play them, no. really. It's like the George Oak piano music, there's more than 200 pieces of his. Or well, the Rossini piano music, there's more, two, more than 200 pieces and Nielsen, of his. And Nielsen, I used to love playing the Nielsen, not, not that so many mm. play that. Well, the, su the suite by Nielsen, I haven't heard played live since John Ogden did it, and that's a while ago. Um, they don't play. There are three pieces of his 59, which are very thorny, but mm -hmm. they're, they're absolutely worthwhile. But mm -hmm. so no, they're big, it's, people aren't adventurous enough. No. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they'll get, they're, they're, they will admit that Nielsen's symphony is good, but then they, they think that's, they've, that's they've done the job now. <laughs> uh, and you try and say, well, actually, you know, did you go and see Masquerade when they did it at Covent Garden? Oh, no, do you write operas? Yes. <laughs> and, uh, but that, that, that's one of the hard things to do with students too. You, even when you put concerts on free, to get them to go to them, mm. is to get a piano player to go to a string quartet concert or a violinist to go to a song recital is apparently a very hard job. Yeah. Um, and I've never understood why. Why wouldn't you be curious to know, uh, you know, what else Foray wrote uh, apart from that fiddle sonata, mm. you know? Yeah. <laughs> wouldn't, you don't think that might have some bearing? You know, if you play a Mozart piano concerto without ever having seen The Marriage of Figaro, I think you're an idiot. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not as if it's impossible to see it. You can see all of these things on DVD if you can't afford the uh, swinging prices down at the Opera House, but uh, yeah, that's true. It's there's m there's more of this stuff available than ever, and and in quality performances and and, and productions. So there's there's really no excuse. Mm. And how can you play a Haydn piano sonata if you don't know his trios or his quartets? And uh, you can't. But um, well, you can, but uh, not in an informed way. Let's say. <laughs> like people to be informed. Then they can be spontaneous and original, <laughs> but first be informed. <laughs> what does playing the piano mean to you? Uh, it's not the only way I think about music. I mean, for example, I never compose at the piano, I always compose 
in the old days at a desk with pen and paper and these days straight into the computer. But, um, but the piano is a great place to go when I want to improvise and when I want to play just to myself. Like when I do want to play just to myself, um, it's frequently not to play piano music. It's mostly either to play bits of operas or ballets or string quartets or symphonies or musicals or songs by Cole Porter. Um, <laughs> no, nobody's ever going to hear me sing any of these things. That would be, <laughs> that would be too awful. But, uh, but I get a lot of pleasure from old older popular music. I think popular music today isn't just isn't a patch. Um, the general standard of musical nous that popular composers had in the 30s, 40s mm -hmm. and 50s. Now they were properly educated people. They knew what a consecutive fifth was and how to avoid it. They knew how to make modulations. They knew how to manipulate the, the most amazing harmonies. Uh, you know, you, from every, everybody from Jerome Kern to Duke Ellington. Um, there's just buckets to learn from those people. Mm. And pop music on the whole doesn't have you, certainly doesn't have me, um, a god with curiosity, which is where I'd like to be with most music. You know, what's, what's he going to do next? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that extraordinary? And half the time you know perfectly well what they're going to do next. <laughs> and when I say next, I'm in for the next five minutes. <laughs> you know. Yes. And you just think a little bit of imagination would have helped there. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure why the pop group as a sort of core thing has developed so little over the last 40 years. You'd think there would have been room mm. for a lot more. I know around the fringes there's a lot more going on, but you know the, the, the mainstream stuff seems to be uh, very, very conservative. Mm. Yeah. It's extraordinary, isn't it? <laughs> and harmonically less interesting than before, and rhythmically much less interesting than before. You know, when, when the Beatles came out, they you know they write songs that started in four four that would go into three four in the middle, and you know they, they, they did musical things that kept you absolutely on the edge of your chair, and very intelligently written and um, nicely harmonised, and you know. They're, they're, and they used string quartet, and, you know, they, all of the things they did, mm. they used the sitar, uh, and it wasn't an experiment, it was actually a musical idea that they put into practice. And um, I always think that there's been a lot less of that since. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's, that's really a pity, but it's also why their stuff is still appreciated and bought and re-recorded and all of that. Enjoyed. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, most people who are under the age of, well, to have heard them. That's, that's 46 years ago, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's a while. 44, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, it's, uh, that's strange. And, you know, I'm always fascinated by uh, listening to old recordings of classical music too. Because we forget sometimes that it wasn't always played the way we play it mm. now. That's very true. And uh, and the things that I remember laughing intemperately at Alfred Cortez's wrong notes. You can't do that. Um, you know, you think about the way they used to record those things. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's amazing mm. if nobody played a wrong note or or fluffed a pedal or. Yes. Made a, a, an extraneous noise or what have you. And of course, we're not allowed to do that. No. Can't leave a wrong note on a record. Um, <laughs> because, you know, there is a difference in what in giving a solid performance and, uh, you know, what you do in a concert. The concerts and recordings, the hardest thing in a recording is to try to recreate what you do in a concert hall. And mm. it, you know, you've got to stop and analyse what you do in the concert hall and then sometimes you've got to watch out because you can you can play all the right notes because you're just a bit 
timid about making mistakes in a recording session. And what comes out is a document. <laughs> anyway, all the notes, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, we didn't have enough time to put the music in, but uh, <laughs> you know, and a lot of recordings because of the constraints and people being frightened and there not mm. being enough time to make a CD. You know, when, when Ron Monoff recorded a double sided 10 inch 78, he had a whole day or even two days to do it. So he could stop, the machine be off, he could practice for an hour, and then things like that. Okay, let's, let's do a take. Um, he also got paid, even in strict monetary terms, more for one side than, than most people get for making five CDs now. Uh, I'm sure. And that's, that's without <laughs> allowing for the difference in the currency rate. So, <laughs> add two zeros. Uh, it's, uh, but they knew, they knew that, that, that they had. They knew every time he went into the studio he was going to make a, yeah. a recording that was going to sell. Of course. Because it was going to be marvellous. Mm, mm. And I would like to see anyone brave enough to say that his recordings are not marvellous. So, best yeah. ever, probably. I think he's the best, I <laughs> yeah. think he's the best player who best recorded. Best player ever. Yeah. 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 Who knows what Liszt's records might have been like. But, uh, Pretty phenomenal. But we know about <laughs> Rachmaninoff's records and also because Rachmaninoff knew how to work in a studio. Yes. And uh, on most recordings from that era, the matrix number gives the take number at the end, and we'd be embarrassed if all our take numbers were published. <laughs> I mean, some of it is because you had to avoid the bird flying around inside the church, or the uh, tractor outside, or the ambulance siren, or whatever, mm. or mostly the aeroplane, um, yeah. because we don't really have soundproof studios. Um, but uh, you look as all of those like one and off recordings and the number of issued takes that are take one or take two are just it's just impressive mm. to a degree. It means he didn't record it until he knew he was gonna do the performance. So that if you ever take more than that, you can get a peculiar idea of what a bad day at the office for him might have been like. And most notably his transcription of um, the scherzo from a Midsummer Night's Dream. I think the issue you'd take is 21. But that's, that's by many, many numbers, more than the next one down, which I think is seven. Um, but uh, even those recordings of his concertos, you know, each, each side, it's mostly take one or take two. It's on the issue disc. Um, Amazing. Well, it'd be nice if we could do that. <laughs> Um, but then, of course, you've got to be allowed to record like that and play like that because this is going to be one straight on performance of five minutes of music, and that's, that's it. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, um, Thanks so much for joining me today. Leslie. That's a great Thank pleasure. You. Thank you.